This podcast is brought to you by Able Training Support Limited, who deliver over 250 engaging and informative training courses to settings that care for or educate adults or children. They deliver face-to-face, virtual and e-learning courses across the UK, and they specialise in courses around understanding people and improving practice. Visit able-training.co.uk for more information. Uh, so welcome everybody uh, to our first ever podcast where I think we're already both feeling quite nervous and don't really feel confident in what we're doing and we'll, we'll kind of muddle through and, and figure this out as we go along. Um, but hopefully this will be the first of many of, of podcasts that we put together uh, around the subject of the care industry and around uh, both supporting and helping carers uh, to better understand their role and get appropriate support as they need to, but also uh, to help understand that those that we're caring for. And we'll be looking at different areas of care as well. So we're not just going to be focusing on elderly care, which we're going to be doing today and focusing focusing on the subject of dementia. We're also going to be looking at areas of things like foster care and children's homes. We'll also be looking at mental health, learning disabilities, any area of people that may be supported, either in the community or in their own homes. Hopefully we'll give some information and some advice and have some chats about those different subjects. But we thought we'd start off this first one we're putting together um, because in September it's um, Dementia Awareness Month. Um, So we thought we'd make it specific around dementia for this first one, just to kind of lead us in and get us started and and see how it goes and take it from there. So we're going to be looking at the focus of September's Dementia Month is on dementia awareness and uh, stigmatization. So improving kind of people's understanding around the subject of dementia. So I thought that was a great kind of starting podcast. Um, we both uh, deliver a number of courses um, across the UK around this, around this subject. And I think there's an awful lot of misunderstandings um, that we come across on a, on a day-to-day, even from people who've been working in the industry and caring for those living with dementia for a number of years. Um, uh, I know that we chatted recently about a situation that might be raise up of kind of a, a group of staff that seemed to be struggling with a particular person because just didn't really understand the condition itself and, and were very much kind of finding it hard to adapt. Um, so we thought we'd talk about what, what is dementia a little bit. Um, one of the things, what kind of misunderstandings have you come across like, related to what is dementia? Oh, all sorts. So I'll just speak from experience. When I first started working with people living with dementia, I didn't know what dementia actually was. So I used to say, oh, they've got dementia or they've got Alzheimer's. And I didn't actually know the difference between the two or understand what it was. So that was one of those. And one of the biggest misconceptions is, is it's just older people. It's just as you get older, that's what happens. It's quite normal. It's not normal. And it's not just a part of age. And so they're they're probably the two biggest things. It's just memory related and age related. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think there's a, as we kind of tackle those, I think the the memory related thing, and I think there's a lot of even understanding of what dementia actually is, because you said there, it tends to be associated immediately with Alzheimer's. Um, and I think that's a maybe a starting point if we start there around kind of that. So we've, we've done some visuals, so we'll, we'll bring this up and see how these work. Uh, so w- there's over, I think you read recently, didn't you? There's over 400 different yeah. types of dementia. Um, that, that figure does vary depending on how they kind of separate it up, doesn't it? So I know that um, it has ranged 150 to 200, yeah. but then if you break it down into the subcategories, so even something like Alzheimer's has multiple different subcategories of types of Alzheimer's disease. It isn't just a case of that's one yeah. diagnosis. Um, but if we got a little bit of information there on the kind of the four most common forms of dementia... So Alzheimer's is the number one, um, as it shows in the statistics there, it's kind of makes up roughly, the figures do vary, but roughly about 60% of all, um, of all about two thirds, I think that we, we saw, didn't we? Um, the second one being made up of, of vascular, which makes up about 20%. And then there's Lewy bodies as well, so Louis, or dementia with Lewy bodies, which also, again, figures vary, but it ranges from about 15 to 20% again. Um, Lewy bodies is one of the the diagnoses that seems to be it's misdiagnosed and it's missed in its diagnosis. So it's quite often um, associated with Parkinson's or Alzheimer's and therefore it gets misdiagnosed. But also it's one that can easily be masked by the behaviours or it doesn't always um, present in the same way. So we believe about 20% um, of cases of, of dementia across the board are also made up of Lewy bodies. Now, if we think about that, that's 60, 20, 20, well, that's your 100%. So that does show you how rare many of the other forms of dementia are. Um, 
We've got the last one on there, frontotemporal lobe, and that makes up only about 2% of the general population as far as um, dementias are concerned. And the big one that we haven't mentioned on there, and I think that it's something you, you mentioned to me earlier, was the kind of the mixed dementias. So dementia with Lewy bodies, for example, shares the same symptoms as Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease. Um, yeah. But you cannot, there's, there's a few cases out there where it's a mix of vascular and Lewy body. So you've got countless different symptoms in there as well. Yeah. Just on the frontal temporal one, yes, it is the well, on the fourth most common. So yeah. it's it's actually not that common but it's very very common between the ages of 45 to 65 so that's the most yeah. common form of dementia within that age bracket yeah and that's what you said earlier wasn't it yeah. as far as the age is is concerned mm -hmm. um that with alzheimer's being the most common and the most well known i suppose is probably the best terminology for it making up 60 percent i think is, this is where a lot of the misconceptions occur because that is the most common type then then there's an overall like stereotype if you like of what somebody with dementia across the board is but i think we were talking in the record is the earliest recorded case of alzheimer's in this country anyway was can you remember what it was uh, i think it's round about so the, there was a little girl 5 years old that yeah. was the rarest but then uh, the next age was actually 23 yeah i have heard of a couple of yeah. uh, being around sort of early 20s as yeah. far as alzheimer's disease so straight away that counters the it's a normal part of aging when people are getting that young onset form of dementia as well so there's lots of different ways that dementia are kind of described, but uh, uh, a degrading brain disease is probably a fairly simplistic way of kind of understanding because it's anything that's causing this, this deterioration in the way that the brain works. Um, one of the reasons I think that memories are commonly associated is because that's the most common symptom associated with Alzheimer's again, isn't it? Yeah. Whereas I think all the different dementias present in a very, very different way. Yeah, definitely. So this is this is one of the problems. So with Alzheimer's, it does affect the memory bank first. So that's where you do notice people that f are quite forgetful, losing that um, communication, losing those communication skills, um, loss of memories and those sorts of things. But that's not always the case in other dementias. It's not one of the signs and symptoms that actually presents first. So it's a really big misconception that it's just memory loss. Um, it's not just memory loss. When we're doing the teaching, we use a few exercises to get people to kind of understand all the complexities. Uh, one of the ones that some people will have come across is a kind of the cup of tea exercise, as, um, which we just get a person to break down into sections how you go about break, making a cup of tea. And such a simple task that we do on autopilot, when you start to break down all the different individual brain functions required, so memory being one, remembering what a cup of tea is and remember where you put your cup and remember what, how you use a kettle. But it's not just about even with something like, um, so I use the example with something like a mug. One is memory of remembering what a mug is, but it's also kind of processing around recognizing the object itself that isn't necessarily around memory. It's more around actual perception or it's around kind of making a connection between the two. So it's not necessarily that they would forget what a mug was. They're just not remembering or recognizing that that is a mug or how it's used in that particular way. So it's, it, although it may come across as memory, they're forgetting how to make a cup of tea. It isn't memory that's necessarily impairing. So I'll, I'll bring up a little thing we can kind of go through. Um, so one of the things we thought might be useful as far as the, uh, the podcast is concerned, and obviously I know some people will just be listening to this and some people will be watching it. So we'll, we'll try and make sure we, we describe everything that we're doing as best we possibly can. Um, but yeah, we, we've, so if we look at the brain as a whole, one of the more simplistic kind of breakdowns of the brain is going to break it into sections. Now, the brain is massively complex. I always use... Um, a bit of an analogy as far as like a, the, the brain is like a forest and every neuron. So neurons are what hold all your memories and your experiences and your behaviors and uh, everything you do feel and, and think on a day-to-day -day basis is made up of these neuron pathways. And every neuron pathway is like a a pathway through your forest. And every time we run down a path, we create a, obviously the grass doesn't grow. We trample that grass down a little bit. And if we keep running across that same path, it becomes fixed. It becomes there as a path ever more and the, and the grass doesn't grow over it. And those paths that we create in early life tend to stay with us, or the ones that we've used a lot tend to stay with us for a very long time. So I use the analogy of kind of riding the bike. So as far as once you learn how to ride a bike, even though you don't ride it for years, so the path's grown over a little bit, very quickly you can back on the bike and you, you're kind of getting your balance back again. Um, 
But when we're when we're young, it's running through a meadow. When we're old, it's like hacking through a jungle. So that's why learning a language when you're five is easy, and learning a language when you're fifty is is bloody hard work. So that that's one of the analogies I kind of love for understanding. And I think if we look at that same analogy, so everything we do think is is a pathway to the forest. And unfortunately, what many of the forms of dementia do is is they create these proteins that block some of these pathways, or they cause some of the pathways to be to die off or to be blocked. So if you imagine that even if I'm remembering, like we just used the example there of a mug, knowing what a mug is, how to use a mug, what it's used for, the abstract concept of a drink, all those sorts of things are, are pathways through the forest. And unfortunately, dementia may cause a log to fall across that path, which means I can't access that information, whether it be the name or how to use it or whatever that is. Now, like if I was walking through a forest and I came across a path and it was blocked, I'd probably try and find a way around it. The thing is, what we kind of don't do is give people time to do that. And that's, I know, one of the things that's expressed from those living with, the, with dementia um, that they find hard because when we, they don't remember something straight away, we tend to then just go, we tell them or we jump past it. Whereas they might get there in the end, they might end up in the wrong place. That's, that's one of the problems, but they're still trying. They're still trying to work around. So um, yeah, let's go into a little bit on the... The brain, and I think that's useful to kind of understand that the different areas of the brain have slightly different functions uh, and they fall into certain categories, if you like. So uh, we've got the different areas. We've got the frontal lobe, which is the just behind the forehead. We've got the parietal lobe, which is just behind that kind of on the top of your head. Your occipital lobe, which is at the back of the brain. Uh, just below that is the cerebellum, uh, which is like a usually shown as like kind of a little brown blob. Uh, and then you've got the temporal lobes down the sides of your head. So uh, I'll pass over to Nadine to tell you a little bit about what each of these areas typically tends to do. So yeah. go for it, yeah. All right. So we'll, we'll start off with the frontal lobe, and this is my favorite lobe. Most human part of your brain, it's where your personality lives, but it's also where your consequences live, your social skills, your ability to manage and respond to sort of situations, okay? So I always use a really good example of this that somebody actually told me about, and it was that um, those social skills within dementia do tend to deteriorate in different forms of dementia. And sometimes it can lead to those odd, quite distressing and sometimes upsetting behaviors. So sometimes like racism, sexually ag um, aggressive behaviors. But one one that sticks in my mind, and I find it really funny, um, this is a carer that was supporting somebody in the community. And um, this lady just went up to a gent sitting on the bench, minding his own business. And she just went up to him. She'd in her nineties with um, Alzheimer's disease, and she said, "Excuse me, love, you're fat enough. You don't need to eat those fish, uh, fish and chips." And the carer said, "My goodness, my my face dropped." She just walked off with a walking stick, <laughs> and his face. She didn't know. Thank goodness she wasn't on her own. But I think this is what we do tend to see, and what we don't understand a lot about that frontal lobe is that, that this is where we do control that behaviour. Now, this can really deteriorate through dementia and it can get worse and fluctuate throughout different dementias as well. Yeah. So sometimes we often look at behavior as it's just them playing up or they're just kicking off. It's that inability to be able to control that behavior and meet a need that they obviously they, they need to meet. So with the frontal lobe, it's a, it's a big one in relation to things like behaviors and understanding complex ideas as well. I remember a similar example to the one you mentioned there. So my gran was a lovely lady, but um, she started being a little bit more assertive in some of her points of view. And she did a very similar thing to a to a nurse when we were in the hospital one time, just kind of she walked past and said, oh, how do, you, how do you get to the size of her? And <laughs> top of her voice, there was yeah. just that filter was just gone at that point. And I think that's that's the best analogy I always kind of think of, that the frontal lobe is kind of your filter yeah. um, a lot of the time. So, it's, yeah. where, it's where your social skills are, isn't it? And Definitely. they do deteriorate, unfortunately. Unfortunately. And, and there's again a misconception that um so some people with dementia they don't really care, so they'll just do it to be harmful towards people. A lot of people with dementia may say sorry after sometimes they've, you know, caused somebody to be upset and distressed yeah. and those sorts of things. Yeah. It's just at that time they don't have that filter. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. there's always a reason. But yeah, should we move on to the parietal yeah, lobe? Yeah, go for it. Parietal lobe has so many different functions. So it's your reading skills, your writing skills, arithmetic skills. Um, it's where your sensory information gets sort of put in um, and tells the rest of the body what to do. So left from right, some spatial awareness skills. Um, here we tend to see a lot of ordering, structuring and sequencing. So where we could tie shoelace, um, you know, tie belt up or tie tie up, do a belt up, <laughs> one or the other. 
So with the parietal lobe as well, and I always talk to the people that we teach about this because they do find it really interesting. I'll always ask, um, have you recognised that a lot of people with dementia swear? So swear words become really apparent during dementia. And a lot of people say, yeah, it doesn't happen for everybody. For a lot, it does. Now, in your parietal lobe, um, with your sensory information coming to that parietal lobe, this is where we get our pain sensory information from as well. So pain management becomes affected in dementia. So for me and you, if we touch something really hot, oh, that bloody hurt. So that so that signal, that message will be carried up to the parietal lobe and the parietal lobe then tells the rest of your brain and your body what to do. So pull your hand away. Now, sometimes this doesn't work as well in dementia. And we always use the analogy, I got a pinch this one from you actually. So um, when you stub your toe, yeah. what do you usually do? We F and Jeff, don't we? <laughs> Definitely. So when we F and Jeff, uh, well, when we're in pain, for example, we get those stress chemicals released. So your cortisol, not the mouthwash, but the cortisol, <laughs> the adrenaline sort of kicks in. Yeah. Um, we're really good at recognising those, but swearing has actually been proven to actively, actively reduce pain. So you sometimes when we swear, for example, and we don't mean swear, we'll say, oh, no, we shouldn't have done that. It's actually a natural pain reliever. So coming back to the parietal lobe, um, a lot of people with dementia, again, different reason from the temporal lobe, lang language capacity and those sorts of things. But we have our two hemispheres. Yeah. Um, for anyone who can't see me, I'm touching my head <laughs> in a really weird way. <laughs> but we have like the left hemisphere, uh, hemisphere, the right one. And on the left side, we tend to lose a lot of um, skills such as formal speech production, comprehension language but on the right and I think this is so interesting on the right side of the brain the right hemisphere we retain things like song lyrics beats rhythm sound and those swear words they yeah. tend to stay there so this is where we say parietal lobe wise with the pain management what if the language capacity is not there to tell a carer for example I'm constipated and I'm in pain and I don't like this they will usually tell you in a different way it's a different form of communication but it's because as well, temporal lobe, parietal lobe, they are not working as well as what they used to. And the person's just trying to navigate a different way. So parietal lobe wise, again, so many different functions, but I always find that one the most interesting when it comes to pain management. Yeah. Something that's really, really disregarded a lot in dementias that again, they're just kicking off most of the time. Something's not quite they're right. communicating, yeah. They're and communicating something. I heard a great term, and I think it might have been Tipa Snow, mm. uh, who's who's both of us a bit of a bit of a hero for both of us i highly recommend checking her out if you're interested in the area of dementia uh, she's an american neuropsychologist and she refers to it they're doing the best they can with what they've got left and i think that's really important if we're looking at it as a kind of a, a degenerative brain disease that the bits that are being damaged they're making they're still having to engage in the world as they are expected to whether they be communicating or expressing their needs and things like that but they may not have the same pathways through the forest again just referring that that analogy so they they're trying to go down that path it's blocked they've got to find a different way to do it so sometimes they end up in the wrong place so absolutely swearing at somebody that they love or things like that maybe the only way they know how to express that they're in discomfort and pain whereas once upon a time they would have told that person mm -hmm. as you said and use the example of kind of constipation and stuff yeah, yeah. So anything else you want to touch on there? I mean, uh, the occipital, we could touch a little bit on that, couldn't we, as far as... Yeah, so, I mean, that's it. That's a, We could talk for hours about the occipital lobe, um, yeah. but I'm not sure anybody would want to. Um, massively... So you build up the, 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 on the next edition of... So uh, yeah, yep, we yep. can make it so it gives a little bit of anticipation for another time. So, yeah, these are essentially the eyes in the back of your head, aren't they? Yeah. So we know many forms of dementia really really do affect this so there is a form of dementia i forget what it's called so i do apologize but it can um it does a primarily affect the occipital lobe i think you, mean, it, you haven't learned all 400 off by heart yeah <laughs> well you know what i do on a friday night no, easy. <laughs> <laughs> um, there is a form and it can actually lead to um blindness so yeah, yeah. um occipital lobe wise um massively impacts on the person's perception so the way that something's perceived and the best way that i'm able to describe this from my past experiences and other people's is things like shadowing on tiles in bathrooms for example not recognizing the person in the mirror that's also in relation to memory but that person in the mirror i don't recognize that's me anymore and um, it's also a lot to do with um visual disturbances so i always use this analogy and i don't know if you use it but did you ever have a carrier bag on top of your wardrobe when you were younger or a tree that shone through uh, in the light at night time and it looked like a scary monster or a scary hand very similar to maybe what that person with dementia is experiencing 
but they actually don't have the recognition that it's not that. It could just be perceived to be something as really scary. Also, what we find as well is environmental navigation is really, really difficult now. So things like um, particular thresholds, so one patterned carpet or flooring changing into another. Some people don't enter certain rooms and those sorts of things. Um, staircases can become very difficult to navigate. Um, even things such as rugs on the floor may appear to be manholes, colour discoloration, depth perception, all those different things that it can affect. So, yeah, environment's really, really important in relation to behaviours as well. I think one of the things like, so although predominantly in Alzheimer's, um, in most forms of Alzheimer's, the occipital lobe's one of the last areas to be affected. It's mm -hmm. affected least. Obviously, there is... Again, this is a spectrum of different dementias and therefore some attack that primarily, even certain forms of Alzheimer's mm -hmm. attack the occ uh, occipital lobe particularly. We are incredibly visual animals. We tend to use our visual processing to kind of navigate our world. So any little impairment of that, even if it's just changes in depth perception or, or recognizing colors or, um, or even not being able to differentiate between the real and the unreal, straight away is going to hugely impact this person's kind of ability to interact and, and have control over their world and, and feel safe in it as well. As you say, it's the, it, I, I always use the dressing gown on the back of the door because I've still got memory of that. I think we've all got one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, with plastic bag on, whatever it was. But yeah. once mum came in and turned the light on and moved the dressing gown, then it was okay because that wasn't there anymore. But for many people, it's, it's still there. It's kind of just summarizing the brain. I'll see, it's, the brain is the most complex structure in the known universe, made up of over 100 billion individual neurons. So it isn't just one or two paths, it's interconnecting paths over 100 billion. And that's, that's a difficult concept for most of us to understand. It is a, a complex system. Uh, and I use complex systems predicting how, um, predicting how dementia will progress in a person and how their brain is going to be affected is a bit like predicting the weather. We have a little bit of idea, but it can very easily go wrong and completely misdirect us. But I think one of the important things to understand it isn't just the one area of the brain being affected. All of those different areas are being affected. And in the early stages, particularly of all the different forms of dementia, it depends on which area is being damaged, depending on which type of illness. But there's also other factors as well, the personality of the individual, the history of the person, you know, if they've got past traumas and stuff like that can massively impact. So therefore, it's that knowing one person with dementia is knowing one person with dementia. So labeling anything along the lines of, you know, they've just lost their memory or it's mm. just an old age thing. Well, that so under, undermines the complexity of, of the illness. Affects everybody completely differently, doesn't it? One of the things we want to talk about is the, the fear related to dementia. Um, I know statistically, once upon a time, the thing that most people were scared of was cancer. Um, but I think now the number one fear for the majority of people towards their end life is, is now dementia. Um, I think there's certain things that perpetuate that, isn't there, as far as uh, the media is concerned is one of those factors. So I'll, I'll bring into a little bit, we've got some um, articles and stuff, and we'll just talk about those and, and kind of bring up. So again, those of you who are, who are just listening to this, I'll kind of read them out. But there's numerous articles that we've got kind of pulled together. Um, and it's from various sources. And, and this is how dementia tends to be communicated and mentioned within the, the media, or how most of us probably talk about it on a day-to-day -day basis. So new dementia crisis on the way, dementia sufferer robbed of a hundred million pounds, middle-aged spread in dementia time bomb, three million, uh, three million, 30 million pound war on Alzheimer's, uh, one in three will suffer dementia studies warned. So articles like this, I think this kind of gives that idea that it's this this terrible, terrible disease, which in in many ways it is. Um, you know, I th I can completely understand why people are frightened of it. I think one of the reasons I think, and and I'm speaking for myself here, and and don't mean to speak for on behalf of anybody else, but I think for many of us, we have almost that idea of when you die, you, you sort of see your life flash before your eyes, and I think there's that fear of losing who you are in the sense of your memories, the thing that maybe we feel we only have to move on to wherever we go to next um, is potentially taken away from us. And I think that's the big fear from an awful lot of people. But I think that's also around the, the misunderstandings. So now one of the things that we we always teach about and talk about is the differences and changing in language around dementia because it's, our understanding of the condition has changed dramatically over the years, but some of the old language is still there. Um, 
I've heard it before and I'm sure you have as well related to in a care home where even, and I know nobody means it derogatory, but things like, oh, I think it's catching because they forget one thing. So what kind of terms have you kind of heard or come across? Um, so one of the one, most common ones that I've heard personally is, oh, they're on one today. It's yeah. going to be like it's a rough day today. So that means basically their dementia is not that great that day. They yeah. are struggling that day, especially with things like behaviour. So they're on one today or they've finally lost the plot, those sorts of things. Yeah. For those that are struggling with alertness and concentration, it's all oh, they're away with the fairies and not here. Yeah. So, yeah, they're, they're somewhere else at the moment. So... I see. It was always kind of referred to as they've lost their marbles, yeah. they've gone crazy, yeah. you know, Nana's gone mad. Um, and even terms like senile and senile dementia had that kind of undertone of just being crazy, I think, and or mad. And that's, those t- terms are still out there as far as mental illnesses generally, aren't they? Well, fun fact, dementia uh, is derived from demons, demeans, um, meaning out of your mind or mad. So that's it's, where the actual name comes from. And that's yes. from the 1300s. So. From the 1300s. You feel, I can see the pride in your face of knowing <laughs> that fact. You know, you just, <laughs> no, but it's from, the, it's from the Latin term. So yeah. it, it was, I've not just made it up, I promise. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, it's actually, so the word dementia actually means mad or yeah. out of your mind. Absolutely. And it's, it's kind of so, a shame that it's still used it's shame, in that way, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, that it's kind of set up like that. But that's again like many mental health conditions, the kind of lack of understanding around what was causing it. So again, I think you mentioned earlier, wasn't it, that people with dementia were often burned at the stake as witches at one point in time. 1600s, that one. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And then moving into the early 1900s, they was often um, electrocuted. There was a a study done where um, a group of people were actually forced to be sick. So they were forced to vomit and those sorts of things to try and get the dementia out of them. So yeah, really, really rough. Absolutely. So... I mean, why why do these terms matter as far as um, the impact of how other people perceive the condition and stuff like that? I think one is how it's perceived by society and, and yeah. stuff, but also imagine that you are the person who gets a diagnosis or a close family member. I think for many, understandably, they see that as the end. That is, my life is over at that point, That's even at the now. point of, yeah, just getting the diagnosis. Uh one of the things is getting the diagnosis in the first place. A lot of people don't go out and get the diagnosis in the early stages. They, there's a, so I've got, I'm going to read off my bit of paper now to kind of show off what I know. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the statistics that was done by a study by the Alzheimer's Society that said that, so 52% of people that, um, said that if they experienced confusion or problems recalling recent events, they would probably wait until the problem was had worsened to the point of affecting work and personal life before they'd visit their GP. As opposed to only 1% would wait for if it was a physical ailment. So for a physical ailment, they wouldn't wait until it affected their job or wait until it affected their, you know, their social life. They'd go straight on and go, this isn't right. And they'd go to the doctors and get some help. But with, with mental health conditions generally, I think there's definitely a truth to it. But with old age and that kind of forgetfulness or struggling with their memory a little bit, there's a real kind of, I think for many of us, it's kind of the hope it'll get better kind of mentality. Yeah, I think it's a hard one as well, especially with things like like the memory loss and forgetfulness. Because how many times do we walk into a room every day and think, what the blooming coming here for? Or, yeah. or you've put your keys down and you think, oh, I can't remember where my keys are. We do just relate that over to general day to day. And we know that stress can cause some lapses in memory sometimes. Yeah. So, And we're all pretty stressed, I reckon. Most of us are anyway. I know you've also, you've talked quite a lot in, in GP settings and stuff like yeah. that, haven't you? And I know that even the tools for, for diagnosing dementia and, and the understanding from healthcare professionals isn't always where it should ideally be. No. Um, obviously, there's some fantastic doctors out there. Oh, and, amazing, and, you yeah. Know, um, I know with a GP, we always have to remember they have to know a little bit about everything. They're not specialists. I think that. it's us. I think we have an expectation on GPs to know everything. Yeah. Um, I've heard countless stories where they've gone, got a diagnosis. So people have gone and got a diagnosis and the doctor said, yeah, you've got dementia. But even doctors don't know where to signpost out, yeah. offer any advice or anything like that. So it's not their fault. 
dementia is so complex and it's can be quite difficult for some people to understand yeah but the doctor's job is just to sort of diagnose and put them yeah, to, in touch absolutely. with memory clinics and those sorts of things but the gps that we did do they, they really found it informative so we have clever strategies of hiding stuff don't we so one of the things is um as you mentioned around the the brain that Many people with dementia, they keep that, that rhythm of music, but they also keep the rhythm of speech yeah. and they can go back. Sometimes they can still do the kind of the, the general chit chat to Good a certain morning. extent. How yes. are you? How's your family? It's one yeah. that's like really common. That's it. So it can give the impression that, oh, look, they're absolutely fine. And, and one of the simple ones, even if I ask, if I ask how old you are and if I ask what your date of birth is, they're two very different questions um, because one is re relying on long term memory. So most of us, from, from as soon as we're able to talk and answer questions, really, we know what our date of birth is. So we've been repeating that over and over again. It never changes. It always stays the same. But our age changes every year. So knowing your date of birth is a very different skill to remembering how old you are, because one is all about orientation in that moment and, and it's short term memory as opposed to kind of long term automatic responses. So if you're going into a doctor's surgery and they go, which date of birth, many people even with a condition would, would mm -hmm. actually be able to nail that. I heard a really upsetting story. It was only just the other day that one lady in particular kept going to the doctors because she felt very unwell. And I mean, this is not every GP. I think this is very rare, but this, the GP told her, stop coming um, um, until you stop drinking. Then we're not going to keep seeing. She was just classed as being drunk. Yeah. They just And she said, I don't drink, I don't drink. And obviously had a behavior in the, in the surgery. And they said, right, well, you're not allowed to come here until you've stopped drinking. And I just thought it was really sad. Yeah. She was being perceived that she was drunk and she had a, brain disease it was just yeah 100 percent. i think um we sort of said sort of our last topic was going to be about the, the kind of the positive side yeah of dementia and i think that's something that probably very few other people will ever really look at and i think it's one of the things that we we do try and get over with especially with teaching carers and family members um one of the things that i encourage within care settings is is for family, it's so difficult to see this loved one that they've always known a particular way to then suddenly be changing and not really understanding that change and desperately wanting their mum or dad or grandfather or whatever to be the same way as they've always been and trying to hold on to that. And there's a big grieving process that many people have to go through as far as, um, you know, having somebody living with dementia in their lives. Um, and I think there's a big responsibility, whether it be organizations or training company like ourselves or or even care settings themselves to really help families to connect with their loved ones i think sometimes i remember in, in every care home i've been to with numerous family members and um and i've seen commonly as a case a family come in they just kind of sit next to the person or they go to their bedroom and they're kind of left to it and it's just a case of yeah go spend time with your mum or go spend time with your family member and but there's no guidance on how to do that and these these family members have no idea about dementia. They don't understand. They're going to find things, certain things upsetting because, you know, being misnamed by your own dad it is, is going to be upsetting. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, if I go and see as my dad gets older and suddenly he forgets my name mm -hmm. and starts calling me the wrong thing, I completely understand why anybody would be upset by that. So if we go into a little bit on the memory side of things and just yeah. maybe help people with that and and why positive engagement in kind of visiting and and just day to day is still important because i'm sure you've heard it as well it's kind of oh they don't remember anyway yeah they do they're not going to know and this is it's a, such a big misconception so maybe a person with dementia won't remember who came to visit yesterday but they'll certainly remember someone came and it was really nice and they gave me a cuddle that it's that emotional content that we tend to retain and not the logic around it obviously yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so um Again, we'll, we'll describe this as best we can. Obviously, there's some some visuals if you're watching this. But um, so we we break it down into uh, this is taken from the Alzheimer's Society as far as a, a great theory. And I don't know who originally kind of came up with the, the way of putting it across. But I think it was somebody called Gemma. <laughs> somebody called Gemma. <laughs> well done, Gemma. <laughs> okay. Now put it down. That, that yeah. counts as an acknowledgement. <laughs> We're not trying to take credit for it ourselves. But it's the, the dual bookcase kind of analogy or, or metaphor. That if you imagine that we've got two bookcases in our brain, and one of these bookcases is our hippocampus, and it's our logical memory, and it's our uh, rationale and facts and reasons, and it's where we retain kind of all of uh, yeah the, the, the short-term memories or the day-to-days. 
Uh, and we've also got then another bookcase, which is our emotional memories and our feelings. And these two different bookcases in our brain are affected differently by the condition of dementia. So if you imagine that every shelf on our bookshelf for the hippocampus is, so what I did five minutes ago is on the top shelf. What I did two days ago is still on the top shelf. But the further down the bookcase I move, the older the memories become. So my childhood memories are down at that bottom shelf and my, my short-term memories, the things that have happened most recently are up on that top shelf. Now, unfortunately, and this, I don't know whether you describe it in the same way, but the the analogy I use is that bookcase, unfortunately, the hippocampus bookcase is is Ikea ball or it's, it's Argos ball. It's a bit of a flat pack and you're not very good at building it. <laughs> okay, It's one of the ones I've built. Um, and unfortunately, the nature of dementia causes that bookcase to be shaken. Okay, So whereas the amygdala is, is uh, kind of more made of oak, so the amygdala bookcase kind of maintains much more effectively and generally as we as we get older anyway. So in the middle stages, what tends to happen is, is this the dementia shaking those both of those bookcases a, a, a lot harder, okay? And we're losing a lot more from those recent memories, that that recent information, the logic fact and reason. So really good story to tell alongside this is there's a lady, um, for example, that may wake up at 90 years old in a care home, her bookcase may have been shaken um, at, at particular times and she's looking through that bookcase. So at the top shelf would be the logic fact and reason that she's 90 years old and that she's in a care home, but that information's now missing. So the brain will just orientate itself using the information it has available and the information available is usually the emotional memory. Now going down her bookcase, it's morning time. I usually take my children to school during this time. Where are my kids? I need to get my children to school. And this is one of the most upsetting things I think about this. We're going down that bookcase and we're going into those earlier memories because they're the ones that have sustained and they're holding on really, really tight. And at this time of day, this is when I take my children to school. And I always say to people, can you imagine waking up not knowing where your children are or where you are or what time era that you're in? Must I, I can see why people do have distressing behaviours. In the middle stages of dementia, we do see th this happening quite a lot. It's also referred to in seasons of dementia. So this will be coming into sort of your autumn stages um, for anybody that's ever read about the seasons in dementia. Um but again, this is where we need to work really hard there with memory orientation. And that brings us nicely onto something else. So therapeutic untruths and love lies. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So let's say I had a family member who misnamed me. There's no point in trying to redirect. All it is that they've, they've lost that book on the bookshelf. They're, they're seeing me as somebody else in that moment. They've looked for a book down the bookcase and they've found somebody who looks familiar. And therefore I become that person or they've just tried to work their way around and found a different name available and that's all they're using and therefore we just go along with our name there's no point in correcting because all we're going to do is upset them that they messed up which means we're affecting the amygdala bookcase causing them upset and distress and reminding them how they got it wrong again rather than just allowing them to be in that moment and suddenly you end up having an argument with them about getting it wrong rather than just enjoying spending time with them so if we've got somebody who's wanting their mum well telling the truth and reminding them that their mum's passed away and that they're 90 and think how old that make their mum is and stuff like that well in the early stages we might find the person go oh yes how silly of me as we get into always mid stages we're just starting to get significant upset around that they're, they're not remembering they're not just going to be able to recollect suddenly we just become a liar that no why are you telling me that my mum's not here when i believe she is and all these feelings are telling me that she should be here so should i just ignore and and not believe my feelings so why are we saying that mum is dead i can see your distress so i'm going to remind you that your mum's dead to make you feel better that just doesn't make any sense but also potentially we shouldn't just be going, she's round the corner, she'll be 10 minutes because they may remember, they may then get more anxious about the fact that she's not there right now. One of the things I get people to think about is put it into a context that well, why would somebody want their mum? And somebody wants their mum because they're missing something. They're still communicating something. Their context is wrong, but their behaviour is is right. So if I felt lonely or if I felt ill, I would probably ask where my mum was well if I'd regressed to that age or that orientation. 
So the therapeutic untruth is going, well, I don't know where your mum is because that's a genuine truth, isn't it? I don't know what happens after we die, so therefore I'm not lying. But then focus on need. Why don't we go through here and we can sit and wait together? Because we can still meet that person's needs and feelings without having to correct them. Yeah, I know you've got some really good examples on that as well. So I personally feel like this is where you can get the positive engagement from them. So it's a, it, so for me, as a coming from a care background, it would be a case of, well, mum's not here at the moment, but why don't we sit and talk about mum? What was her name? And engaging in those positive memories. Obviously, there is a reason. It's that emotional, I want my mum. I might be feeling a bit insecure, a little bit unsafe. Why not engage and talk about mum for a bit? Um, one of the biggest things that we hear as well, when people are emotional with dementia, we hear, don't cry. It's all right. They're allowed to yeah, cry. Let yeah. them have, you know, someone's missing their mum. I, I think that's a really good positive thing to encourage and holding their hand through that. Um, you read diversion and distraction kind of things. They can come in all different forms, but it's always got to be meaningful to the person and not to somebody else. So, oh, it's all right. You just go watch EastEnders for five minutes and we'll sort it out. What if I don't like EastEnders? Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's not going to work. But engaging people into obviously trying to help them find the truth themselves or it's not necessarily lying to them, but sometimes it's just listening. So, you know, why do you want mum? What, what's going on? That's okay. I want my mum sometimes too. And it's empathising and sympathising with the person that I think could be really useful. I think that's a, that's a big thing, isn't it? It's yeah. Even even if we're using redirection or anything like that, we've got to go into where this person is in this moment. Yeah. Um, it's one of my favourite kind of sayings that I repeat, and again, I've nicked them all from elsewhere, nothing's my own, is connection before correction. Now, I'm not saying you should be correcting the person when we're working with dementia, but we've got to connect with them first. Yeah. Why would, as you gave the example there, of all go in the other room and watch EastEnders, well, you haven't listened to me, I'm upset about something. So the fact that you've not acknowledged I'm upset, you've not tried to understand them upset, you've not tried to connect with me and listen to me about that, why would I then, you're just dismissing me rather than understanding me. And I think that's where people need to go to is just acknowledging the person's feelings which is the truth um listening to them and then putting it into context well how would i help a person who is in this emotional state whether the yeah. truth of what has or has not happened is irrelevant yeah, yeah definitely how can i engage with the person emotionally rather than logically because that's the environment they're in one of the things if we turn it over to the positive and using this if the bookshelves on the bottom of the of the uh, hippocampus are still the ones that are retained last. They're the ones that, and this could be a really positive thing if we turn it around a different view. And I heard a lovely kind of way of putting it across from somebody where they sort of said, like, most of us, when we go and visit our parents, for instance, it tends to be very chit chatty. It tends to be, so what you've been up to, what you've been doing. And and we tend to just focus on the frivolous and the, the kind of the here and now. When you don't have those available, if, if your parent then can't tell you what they had for tea last night because it's not available to them, and actually asking them causes them more distress in the fact that they, they can't remember, then we can go back to the memories that they can remember, which could be their childhood or the job they used to do. And they might be able to talk for hours about those particular things. And they're, they're topics and subjects. So we don't always take the time to get to know with our with our loved ones. Um You've always said it, Andy. What What's the one thing that people love talking about most? <laughs> ourselves. Yeah, of course That's because it is. I love talking about myself more than anything. <laughs> but I think it is a generalisation across no, the board. I hope it's just, just not my neuroticism. I think most people, I'm not going to speak for everyone, but most people like talking about their childhoods or their teenage years, what they got up to, their first loves and all those sorts of really nice, fun things. And this is where we're at in this sort of stage of dementia, aren't we? In those later stages. Yeah. I may be able to tell you all the emotions from there and all the cheeky things that somebody used to get yeah. up to. And it can be difficult, really nice. obviously, if somebody doesn't have those positives in their life sometimes. It can be really difficult, yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing is, we're talking about you know, everybody's favourite subject to themselves, but it's, it's, it is ourselves, but it's what we like talking about. So of course it is. I may not like talking about my family, but I may love talking about my friends as, as an example sort of thing. So it, that may be something that, so it's finding again their favourite subject and something course, that they engage yeah. with, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Um. I think one of the other things with that a lovely story I heard um, was from a lady who said that she was looking after a mum and her mum, when she went in, just seemed to be kind of not distressed, but kind of a nervous excitement. And her mum had reorientated herself to it was her wedding day and she was panicking about like wait, making sure her dress and her hair was done right and her makeup was right. And she was she was talking in this kind of excited anticipation that everybody does kind of on their wedding day. And 
basically the daughter kind of just referred to going, it was kind of beautiful in the fact that I never was there at my mum's wedding day. But to see my what my mum was like on her wedding day and the, the feelings she was having and the experiences and things that she was worrying about was kind of beautiful. And I think that's a lovely thing to kind of, uh, that was, I found that quite a moving story of being yeah, able to- it's lovely. To kind of um, something that, again, most of us don't get that window into our loved one's past and soul and stuff like that in in the way that maybe we do with something on dementia. I think there's the other thing is that even though the brain is being affected, the rate that that brain will be affected varies from person to person. When we talked about, um, you referred to kind of the... the um, seasons of dementia so that's kind of a progression through the illness and something like alzheimer's tends to have a, a steady progression over a period of time whereas something like vascular tends to have a stepped deterioration Lewy bodies tends to fluctuate more so again the journey for everybody through their illness is is very different from one person to another but you should always be focused on the person's abilities not their disabilities you should always be focused on where their strengths are and i know you do a lot as um, promotion around strength-based risk assessments and yeah. strength-based care plans. We look at like what that. skills the person has retained rather than what they haven't retained yeah. and then adapting whatever their preference or whatever their chosen activities are yeah. and we adapt it to the different stages and it's it's a really good thing and it's very, very popular now throughout yeah. care as well. So people are given that bit of therapeutic risk-taking and thinking, oh, we know that so-and-so can't run around and play football anymore, but maybe we can take him to a stadium now or maybe we can yeah. take him to the local pub so he gets that interaction and social inclusion still. And I think it's really, really good. Yeah, absolutely. I, know that, um, I had a uh, friend whose dad started doing walking football, oh. which, is, which is basically <laughs> it was uh, kind of lots of older men who just went down and they, the rules were no running. So they yeah. had to kind of hold back a little bit. Did they bit. have a ref? <laughs> I, I think I mean, they must have had a ref because I just imagine they still got got angsty with each other at times but yeah. yeah they they had to kind of walk around playing football and that's it there's no reason why you couldn't still have a game of football in the in the garden even if somebody's using some kind of walking aid you know it, uh, i did read a wonderful article and i'll kind of put again for those of you watching a bit of a visual it's a uh, a guy called I, can, I can't pronounce his name i think he's because he's canadian I think French Canadian. I'm not 100 percent sure, I'm not but sure. Um, yeah, Shion Jar, uh, 68, who was diagnosed with Alzheimer's in in 2012. He's still alive. He's still going strong. I think he was very poorly over over COVID at one point, but he's he's come out the other side. But he um, every day he was climbing the same mountain. Uh, so it was one that he'd always loved climbing. And I think when he first got his diagnosis, he he obviously did like all of us probably naturally would thinking this is the end, but he, he took that step to decide, no, this isn't going to stop me. I'm going to carry on doing what I love. Maybe I can't work anymore. So maybe I just need to do what I can, which is, so he climbed this um, 2,634 foot hill, which doesn't sound like a hill to me, um, which is steep descent at least 5,000 times. Uh, so I, I can't remember when this article was put together, but I know that he's still going. I don't know if he's still climbing mountains, but but that was somebody whether that, obviously that was... um. Still classes, not young onset dementia. He was 68 when he first got his, his diagnosis, which we might see as quite young for getting the diagnosis. But um, yeah, still able to be thoroughly active and engaged. And I think that's, that's so important to, again, whether it be cognitively or physically, there's still things they can do. And if we're thinking about the pathways to the forest, they're still creating new memories and new pathways. And uh, they may not be laid down in the same way, but they're still, they're still there. We, we kind of discussed on numerous occasions how we were going to kind of go through these topics. And I've just noticed we reached the bottom of the page where it does not know kind of an outro or anything like that. But how am I going to finish this thing? Um, which is probably, it's probably the best way to finish the first one on a bit of a... So hopefully this was not such a mess and we kind of pulled something together that was kind of informative and, and fun and engaging. Um, and we'll kind of look at putting more of these together. But yeah. So hopefully you found the podcast interesting and, and keep in touch for the next time. But I think from me, that's bye-bye and... <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much for watching our podcast today. Um, if you've enjoyed what you've seen, we really want some support from you guys. We want to keep doing this. So please like, comment and subscribe on the video. You hopefully know where to click. 
If um, you've enjoyed the session, well, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, you can email us at any point on podcast at able-training.co.uk with any questions, stories, anything that's relevant, or we'll look at your comments and get back to you, hopefully. Cheers.